The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 3 of 10. Chapter 1, The Numenon in the Tathagata Store. Fusing the Six Entrances. Entrance through the eyes. Again, Ananda, why are the six entrances of illusions into the mind fundamentally the absolute nature of the Tathagata store? Ananda, the steadying of the seeing that disturbs the sight, as well as the eyes and the disturbance itself, are but trouble arising from Bodhi. Because the seeing arises between the two states of light and darkness, they are drawn into Alaya's perception, which is called the faculty of seeing. This seeing has no independent substance that exists apart from the two states of light and dark. Therefore, Ananda, you should know that this seeing comes from neither light nor darkness, and from neither the organ of sight nor the void. Why? Because if it comes from light, it would cease to exist when darkness appears, and would not perceive the latter. If it comes from darkness, it would be no more when there is light, and would not perceive the latter. If it comes from the organ of sight, there would be no objective light and darkness. Then such essence of perception would have no nature of its own. If it comes from the void, when it perceives these two states, it would also see the organ of sight. Moreover, the void would thus perceive everything of itself, and have nothing to do with entrance through your eyes. Therefore, you should know that entrance through the eyes is false, and is neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Entrance through the ears. Ananda, if a man suddenly closes his ears with two fingers, disturbance will arise in this sense organ, and he will hear sounds in his head. This closing of the ears, as well as the ears, and the disturbance experienced are trouble that comes from Bodhi. Since this hearing arises between the two states of stillness and motion, they are drawn into Elias' perception, which is called hearing. This hearing has no substance independent of stillness and motion. Ananda, you should know that this hearing comes from neither stillness nor motion nor from a sense organ, nor from the void. Why? Because if it comes from stillness, it should cease to exist when there is motion, and would not hear the latter. If it comes from motion, it should cease to exist when there is stillness, and would not hear the latter. If it comes from a sense organ, there would be no objective stillness, nor motion. Then this faculty of hearing would have no nature of its own. If it comes from the void, that which can hear is certainly not the void. Moreover, the void would hear of itself, and will have nothing to do with that entrance through your ears. Therefore, you should know that entrance through the ears is neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. Entrance through the nose. Ananda, if a man suddenly holds his breath, his nostrils will feel cold. Because of this feeling, he can distinguish clearance or ventilation from obstruction or suffocation, and emptiness from fullness, and can smell fragrant and offensive odors. The restraint of breath, as well as the nose and its feeling, are trouble that comes from Bodhi. Since feeling arises between the two false conditions of clearance and obstruction, sensations are drawn into Elias perception, which is called smell. This smell has no substance independent of clearance and obstruction. You should know that it comes neither from these two states, nor from the nose, nor from the void. Why? Because if it comes from the clearance, it will cease to exist when there is obstruction. But why does it feel the latter? If it comes from obstruction, it will cease to be clear. But why does it come into contact with fragrance and stench? If it comes from a sense organ, there would be no objective clearance and obstruction. Then, this faculty of smelling would have no nature of its own. If it comes from the void, it should be able to smell your own nose. If so, the void itself would smell and would have nothing to do with that entrance through your nose. Therefore, you should know 
that the entrance is neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. Entrance through the tongue. Ananda, if, for instance, a man licks his lips again and again, he will have trouble with his sense of taste. If he is ill, he will experience a bitter taste, and if he is healthy, a somewhat sweet one. Thus, bitterness and sweetness reveal this sense which is always tasteless in the absence of stirring feelings, and which, together with the tongue and the trouble caused by the taste, are but illusion which comes from Bodhi. This illusion is due to false externals such as bitterness and sweetness, and is drawn into Elias' perception which is called taste. This taste has no independent substance apart from flavors such as sweetness and bitterness, and tastelessness. Ananda, you should know that this perception of taste comes neither from the flavors such as sweetness and bitterness, nor tastelessness, nor from a sense organ, nor the void. Why? Because if it comes from sweetness and bitterness, it will vanish in the state of tastelessness. But why does it feel the latter? If it comes from tastelessness, it will disappear when in touch with sweets. But why does it still feel sweet and bitter tastes? If it comes from the tongue, the latter originally is neither tasteless, nor sweet, nor bitter. Hence, we know that the organ of taste has no nature of its own. If it comes from the void, the latter not being your mouth, would taste by itself. Then what has it to do with that entrance through your tongue? Therefore, you should know that this entrance is unreal and is neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. Entrance through the body. Ananda, for instance, when a man touches his warm hand with his cold one, if the coldness exceeds the warmth, the warm hand will become cold. And if the warmth exceeds the coldness, the cold hand will become warm. This touch is revealed when the two hands meet and then separate. This contact causes the feeling of touch, which, together with his body and the illusion experienced, are but trouble which comes from Bodhi. This trouble occurs where there are two false conditions of contact and separation, and is drawn into Elias' perception which is called touch. This touch has no independent nature apart from contact and separation, and from pleasant and disagreeable conditions. Ananda, you should know that this perception of touch comes neither from contact nor separation, nor from pleasant nor disagreeable conditions, nor from a sense organ, nor the void. Why? Because if it comes from contact it should vanish in the state of separation. But why does it feel the latter? It is the same with pleasant and disagreeable conditions. If it comes from a sense organ, it would be free from contact and separation and from pleasant and disagreeable conditions. Then your body that feels them would have no nature of its own. If it comes from the void, the latter will feel the touch by itself. Then what has it to do with your entrance through the body? Therefore, you should know that this entrance is false and is neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. Entrance through the intellect. Ananda, when, for instance, a man is tired, he sleeps soundly, and when he awakes, and when he sees objects, he remembers, and after a time forgets all about them. This is the inverted condition of birth, stay, change, and death, which is continuously drawn into the inner intellect. Hence, the organ of manas, which, together with the intellect and the trouble experienced, are an illness arising in Bodhi. This illness comes from perceiving the two false conditions of birth and death, a perception which covers all inner data that cannot be reached by seeing and hearing. Hence it is called knowing. This knowing has no substance of its own apart from the waking and sleeping states and from the conditions of birth and death. Thus, Ananda, you should know that the organ of knowing comes neither from the waking and sleeping states nor from the conditions of birth and death, and neither from a sense organ nor the void. Why? Because if it comes from the waking state, it should cease to exist in the sleeping state. Then why does one sleep? 
If it comes from birth, it should be void at death. Then who will die? If it comes from death, it would cease at birth. Then who is living? If it comes from a sense organ, then while the body experiences the two states of waking and sleeping, the knowing has no nature of its own apart from these two states and will be like a flower in the sky. If it comes from the void, the latter will know everything and will have nothing to do with your entrance through the intellect. Therefore, this entrance is neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. Fusing the Twelve Ayatana Six Sense Organs and Six Sense Data Eyes and Form Again, Ananda, the Twelve Ayatana are fundamentally the same as the absolute of the Tathagata store. Ananda, just look at the grove and stream in Jetavana Park. Is it form that creates the eye seeing or vice versa? If the organ of sight creates form, when you see the void which is not form, form would vanish, which means that nothing would exist. Then if form is no more, what can be used to reveal the void? It is the same with the void. If form produces the eye seeing, when you see the void which is not form, your seeing would vanish, which means that nothing would exist. Then who distinguishes the void from form? Therefore you should know that neither seeing nor form nor the void has a place of abode, and that form and seeing are false, and are neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent ears, and sound. Ananda, in Jetavana Park, when you hear a drum beat to announce a meal and a bell rung to summon the bhikshus, these sounds succeed one another. Do they come to the ears, or do the ears go to them? Ananda, if they come to the ears, it is like when I go to Shravasti to beg for food and am absent from Jetavana Park. If these sounds come to Ananda's ears, Madhgalaputra and Kasyapa should not hear them. Then why do all the 1250 bhikshus, when they hear the bell, go together to the eating hall? If your ears go to the sound, it is like when I return to Jetavana Park and am not in Travasti. Then when you hear the drum, if your ears go to it, you should not hear the bell, which rings at the same time, nor the sound of elephants, horses, buffaloes and sheep in this park. If there is no such coming and going, there would be no hearing. Therefore, you should know that hearing and sound have no location and that both are false, being neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Nose and Smell Ananda, just smell the smoke of sandalwood in this burner. The quantity burnt is small but its fragrance spreads to Shravasti and the neighborhood. Do you think that this perfume comes from the sandalwood, from your nose, or from the void? Ananda, if it comes from your nose, it should be produced by and spread from it. But since your nose is not sandalwood, how can there be this fragrance there? If you say that you smell perfume, it should be inhaled into your nose, but since it emanates from it as aforesaid, it is wrong to say that you smell it. If it comes from the void, the latter being permanent, this fragrance should be so as well, and there would be no need to burn dry sandalwood. If it comes from the sandalwood, its fragrant substance has become smoke by burning, and if your nose smells this perfume, your nose should be full of smoke. As smoke rises in the air, how can it be smelt in distant places even before it reaches them? Therefore, you should know that odor, nose, and smelling have no fixed location and that smelling and odor are false, being neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Tongue and Taste Ananda Twice a day you go out to beg for food, and occasionally are given butter and cream, which are tasty delicacies. Do you think that this taste comes from the void, your tongue, or the food? Ananda, if it comes from your tongue, the latter has already become butter. And since you have only one tongue, how can you then taste honey? 
If you do not, this means that your taste does not change. Then how can it be called tasting? If it changes, and since your tongue is of one substance, how can this single tongue know various tastes? If it comes from the food the latter cannot know, then how can it taste itself? Assuming that it knows itself, it and other food will have nothing to do with your tasting. If it comes from the void, when you bite the air, what does it taste like? Assuming that it comes from the void, when the latter tastes salt, as your tongue is salty, your face should be so too. If so, all men would be like fish in the sea. If you are salty, you will not know what is tasteless. If you do not know what is tasteless and do not taste salt, you will have no taste. Then how can there be taste? Therefore, you should know that neither taste nor tongue nor tasting has location, and that tasting and taste are false, being neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Body and Touch Ananda you are accustomed to rub your head with your hand every day early in the morning. When feeling this rub, do you know whether that which rubs is your hand or your head? If it is your hand, then your head, an object, should not feel that it is being rubbed. If so, how can there be touch? If it is your head, there would be no need for your hand to rub it. Then how can you call it touch? If both hand and head are subjects, then you, Ananda, should have two bodies. If it comes from the contact of your hand with your head, then both your hand and head should be one, and one thing cannot contact itself. If it is two, that is, hand and head, from which does it arise? For subject and object differ. Neither can there be touch when your head comes into contact with the void. Therefore, you should know that neither the feeling of touch nor your body has location, and that they are false, being neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Intellect and Dharma Ananda, because of good, evil, and neutral causes, your intellect or manas always gives rise to Dharma. Are these Dharma created by the mind, or do they exist apart from it and have their own place? Ananda, if they are the same as the mind, they cannot be its objects, for they are not its causal phenomena. Then how can they have a place of their own? If they exist apart from the mind and have their own place, do they possess the faculty of knowing or not? If they do, they are merely the mind. But since they have the faculty of knowing and differ from you, they should not be your dharma, but should belong to someone else's mind. If they have the faculty of knowing and are your dharma, at the same time, they are merely your mind. Then, how can you have another mind as well as your own? If they differ from you and do not have the faculty of knowing, where are they, since they are not inanimate phenomena such as form, sound, smell, and flavor, nor cold and warmth due to contact or separation, as well as to the void? Since they cannot be shown in either form or the void, there should not be in the universe another voidness outside the void. Assuming that there is another outer voidness, they cannot be the mind's causal phenomena. Then where are they? Therefore, you should know that neither dharma nor mind has location, and that intellect and dharma are both false, being neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Fusing the eighteen fields or realms of the senses. The field of sight perception. Again, Ananda, why are the eighteen fields or realms of the senses the same as the absolute in the Tathagata store? Ananda, as you already know, eyes and form are causes that beget sight perception. Is this sight perception created and conditioned by the eyes or by form? Ananda, if it is created by the eyes, in the absence of both form and the void, there will be nothing to be differentiated. Then what is the use of this perception, even if you own it? In this instance, what you see will be neither blue, yellow, red, nor white. 
where then can you show its boundary? If it is created by form, when you see the void, which means that form is absent, your perception should cease to exist. Then why do you still distinguish the void? When form changes, you notice it, but your perception is unchanging. Then where can its boundary be? If perception follows the change of form to undergo its own change, there would be no boundary. If it is unchanging, it should be permanent. Then, as it is created by form, it should not perceive the void. If it is created by both the eyes and form, these two are separate when you think that they are united, and unite when you think that they are separate. If so, both intermingle. Then, how can there be the realm of the eyes and that of form? Therefore, you should know that both causal eyes and form, as well as the so-called created perception, do not exist, and that the eyes, form, and the realm of form are neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. The Field of Sound Perception Ananda, as you already know, ears and sound are causes that beget perception of sound. Is this perception created and conditioned by the ears or by sound? If it is created by the ears, this organ, in the absence of both disturbance and stillness, does not discern anything and is therefore devoid of objects. If it cannot discern, how can it create perception? Assuming that hearing begets perception by the ears, since no hearing occurs in the absence of both disturbance and stillness, how can the ears, which are form, unite with external objects to produce perception? And where can the latter's field be? If it is created by sound, that is, if it depends solely on sound, then it should have no relation to your hearing. But if hearing ceases, there will be no sound. Now, assuming that it is really created by sound, and that sound exists because of hearing, then your hearing of sound should be perceived by the ears. If this sound is not perceived, it would have no relation with the realm of ear perception. On the other hand, if it is heard, it is already sound, and since it is hearing's object, it cannot discern anything. Then who knows the perception? If there is no such knower, you will be like grass and plants. There cannot be a mixing of sound and hearing to create between them an intermediate realm of perception by the ear, for such a realm cannot be at the center, in the inner organ, or in the outer sound. Therefore, neither ears nor sound exist as causes, nor perception by the ear as effect, and ears, sound, and its field are neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. The Field of Smell Perception Ananda, as you already know, the nose and smell are causes that beget the perception of smell. Is this perception created and conditioned by the nose, or by smell? If so, Ananda, what is this nose? Is it that hooked and fleshy part of your face with which you sniff but this piece of flesh belongs to the body, and the body's perception is called touch. The body is not the nose, and touch is its object. If the nose cannot be named, where is it? If it perceives smell, where is that perception in your mind? If perception comes from a part of the face, it is touch and has nothing to do with the nose. If it comes from the void, it should be known by the latter instead of being felt by the flesh. If so, the void should be you, and your body would feel nothing. Then there would be no Ananda anywhere at the moment. If smell is the knower, it should know itself, and would have nothing to do with you. If good and bad smells create your nose, they should not produce sandalwood and fetid herbs. Without the latter, smell your own nose, and see if it is fragrant or offensive. Since fragrance cannot stink, and stench cannot be fragrant, if you can smell both, you should have two noses. And now, as you ask me about the Dharma, there should be two Anandas. Then, which Ananda are you? If there is only one nose, and if fragrance and stench are not two different smells, they can be mistaken for each other. 
which proves that neither exists. If so, where can the field of smell perception be established? If it is created by smell, and if perception exists because of smell, it is like your eyes, which can see things but not themselves. So that perception which exists because of smell should not scent it. If it does, it cannot be created by smell, and if it does not, it is deprived of that perception. Since smell does not depend on perception, it has no field. If perception cannot smell, its field cannot be established on the basis of smell. Since there is no intermediate perception between nose and smell, there would be neither inner organ nor outer object. Thus, smell perception is false. Therefore, neither nose nor smell as causes nor the field of smell perception as their creation exist. While nose, smell, and its field are neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. The Field of Taste Perception Ananda, as you already know, tongue and taste are causes that beget perception by the tongue. Is this perception created and conditioned by the tongue or by taste? Ananda, if it is created by the tongue, then sugar cane, sour black plums, bitter wort, rock salt, wild spikenard, ginger, and cassia would be tasteless. Taste your own tongue and see if it is sweet or bitter. If it is bitter, who is the taster? Since the tongue cannot taste itself, who experiences the taste? If it is not bitter, no taste can come from it. Then how can it be conditioned? If perception derives from taste, it would be taste itself. But, like the tongue, it cannot taste itself. Then how can it distinguish various flavors? Again, since there are many flavors which cannot come from a single source, there should be as many corresponding perceptions. If there is only one, and if it is created by different flavors, then all salt, insipid, sweet and bitter flavors should unite and become one. Then there would be no discerning. If so, there would be no perception by the tongue. How then can the tongue, taste and perception be conditioned? The void cannot make your mind perceive. Since tongue organ and taste object cannot unite to create an intermediate perception, where is the latter's field? Therefore, tongue and taste as causes and the field of taste perception as their creation do not exist, while tongue, taste and their field of perception are neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. The field of touch perception Ananda, as you already know, body and touch are causes that create the perception of touch. Is this created and conditioned by the body or by touch? Ananda, if it is created by the body, what does the latter perceive when there is neither contact nor separation? If by touch, your body would not be needed, then who can, without a body, feel contact and separation? Ananda, objects do not perceive touch, but the body knows and feels it. Body's perception is revealed by touch and touch through the body. Therefore, body and touch are inseparable, but they are not the same, and so originally they have no home. When touch contacts body, it becomes the body, and when it ceases, it becomes the void. Since there are no such things as inner body and outer touch, how can there be an intermediate perception between them? Where then is the field of body perception? Therefore, body and touch as causes and body perception as their creation do not exist, and all three are neither causal, nor conditional, nor self-existent. The Field of the Sixth Consciousness Ananda, as you already know, intellect or manas, and dharma or ideas are causes that create the sixth consciousness. Is this consciousness created and conditioned by intellect or by dharma? Ananda, if this consciousness is created by intellect, the latter, as organ, should contain dharma as object to reveal its own existence. 
In the absence of Dharma, your intellect does not exist and cannot create anything. Even if it does create consciousness, what is the latter's use if it is not confronted with causal ideas or Dharma? Moreover, both your mind, that is the sixth consciousness, and your thinking process, that is the intellect, discern ideas and things. Are they the same as or different from each other? If the same, consciousness is just intellect, then how can it be created by intellect? If different, consciousness would be unconscious, then how can it come from intellect? If it is also conscious, then tell me what intellect and consciousness are. Therefore, they are neither the same nor different. Then where is the field of consciousness? If consciousness is created by Dharma, all things in the world are inseparable from the five sense data of form, sound, smell, taste, and touch, which clearly correspond with the sense organs and are not affected by the intellect. If your consciousness depends on Dharma for its existence, look carefully into Dharma and see what they look like for beyond form and voidness, motion and stillness, clearness and obstruction, union and separation, and birth and death. Where can Dharma be found? For Dharma arise simultaneously with form, voidness, etc., and vanish with them. Since there are no causes leading to their creation, what are the forms and shapes of Dharma? If these do not exist, what then conditions Dharma? Therefore, intellect and Dharma as causes and the field of the sixth consciousness as their creation do not exist, and they are neither causal nor conditional nor self-existent. Fusing the seven elements into the absolute to reveal the free intermingling of phenomenon and noumenon. Ananda said to the Buddha, World Honored One, the Tathagata has often spoken of cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, and has taught us that all changes and transformations in the world are due to the mixture and fusion of the four elements. Why does he now wipe out all concepts of cause, condition, and the state of self as such? I do not understand. Will he be compassionate enough to explain in full to all living beings the mean which is beyond all sophistry? The Buddha replied, You are tired of and have sought to abandon the Hinayana teaching on the Shravaka and Pradyaka Buddha stages and so wish to seek unsurpassed Bodhi. I will therefore teach you the supreme truth why do you still restrict yourself by reasoning frivolously about false causes and conditions? Although you have listened to me a lot, you are like one who is accustomed to talk about medicines, but who, when he sees them, cannot pick out those which are good. This is why the Tathagata says that you are really to be pitied. Listen with attention to what I now tell you, so that all who practice Mahayana in the future can attain reality. Ananda kept silent, awaiting the holy teaching. Exposing Faulty Differentiation Ananda, as you have said, when the four elements mix and fuse, they cause all kinds of transformation in the world. But they cannot mix and unite if it is against their nature, just as the void cannot with form. On the other hand, if they so mix and fuse, they are transformations and owe their existence wholly to their mutual dependence. They are thus subject to creation and destruction in endless succession, like the ring of fire caused when a torch is waved in a circle. Pointing to the One Source Ananda, this is like water, which, after becoming ice, can change back into water. Instruction on the Seven Elements The Element of Earth Look at the element of Earth, which ranges in size from the great Earth to a tiny speck of dust. Split this speck, which is near to nothing, and reduce it to the finest moat on the extreme border of form. Then split it again, and it becomes the void. Ananda, if this moat can be reduced to nothing, 
you should know that form comes from the void. You now ask about material changes which you attribute to the mixing and uniting of the four elements. Take, for instance, this moat, which is nearest to the void. How much voidness should be mixed and united to produce it? But it is absurd to suppose that this can be done by uniting moats. Since a moat can be split and reduced to voidness, how many particles of form should be fused together to create the void? The union of form with form produces form, but not voidness. And the union of the void with the void produces voidness, but not form. Form can be split up, but how can the void unite with form? You do not know that in the Tathagata store, both form and its opposite, the void, arise from self-nature and are identical with each other, and that the element of earth is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things in accordance with the laws of karma. Ignorant worldlings wrongly attribute this to cause condition and the state of the self as such, because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate without their knowing that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Fire Ananda, fire has no ego, but exists because of external causes. When people in a town are about to prepare their meals, they use mirrors of polished metal to obtain fire from the sun. Ananda about your idea of mixture and union, take this community of myself and 1250 bhikshus. Though the group is one, each member has his own body, clan, and name, like Sariputra, who is a Brahmin, or Uvilva, a Kasyapa tribesman, and you, Ananda, who are of the Gautama clan. Ananda, if fire comes from the mixture and fusion of the elements, when a man holds a mirror to obtain fire in the sun, does this fire come from the mirror, the moksa, or the sun? Ananda, if it comes from the sun, it can burn the moksa in your hand. If so, all the trees will be scorched. If it comes from the mirror, and then lights the moksa, why does it not melt the mirror and burn your hand? But if you do not even feel the heat, how can the mirror melt? If it comes from the moksa, why does the latter require the sun and the mirror to make it burn? Look at the mirror held by the hand, the sun up in the sky, and the moksa which originally came from the ground. How can fire travel elsewhere before coming here? Moreover, the sun and the mirror are a very long way apart and cannot mix and unite with each other. Finally, fire cannot exist by itself. You do not realize that in the Tathagata store, both fire and its opposite, the void, arise from the self-nature and are identical with each other, and that the element of fire is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the mind of living beings know and distinguish between things. Ananda, you should know that the fire is produced wherever a man holds a mirror in the sun, and that if mirrors are held up throughout the Dharma realm, fire will spring up everywhere in accordance with the laws of karma, and not in a given place and direction. Ignorant worldlings wrongly attribute this to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, without realizing that it is because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate, and that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Water Ananda, water is unstable by nature, for it either flows or is still. Great magicians in Shravasti, such as Kapila, Chakra, Padma, and Hasta obtain water to mix with their medicines by exposing a crystal ball to the full moon. Does this water come from the ball, the void, or the moon? Ananda, if it comes from the moon, which is a very long way off, it should pass through the trees in the forest before reaching the crystal ball to flow into the bowl. If it does not flow through the trees, this shows that it does not drop from the moon. 
If it comes from the crystal ball, it should flow regularly, and not only when the moon is full. If it comes from the void of space, which is boundless, it should flow everywhere, submerging everything between earth and heaven. If so, how can there be living beings to walk on the earth, fly in the air, and swim in the water? Think of all this again. The moon is in the sky, the crystal ball is in the man's hand, and the bowl is in front of him. So where does this water come from to flow into the bowl? The moon and the ball are a very long way apart and cannot mix and unite with each other. It is absurd to say that this water does not come from any source. You do not know that in the Tathagata store both water and its opposite the void arise from self-nature and are identical with each other, and that the element of water is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all in the Dharma realm, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things. Thus water flows wherever crystal balls are used to collect it, and if they are held up throughout the Dharma realm, it will flow everywhere in accordance with the laws of karma, and not in a given place or direction. Ignorant worldlings wrongly attribute this to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, without knowing that it is because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate, and that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Wind Ananda, the element of wind, has no substance and either moves or is still. When you join a gathering and adjust your robe, the hem occasionally brushes the person next to you, disturbing the air which fans his face. Does this wind come from the hem of your robe, from the void, or from that man's face? Ananda, if it comes from the hem of your robe, the latter should leave your body to brush the man's face. As I preach the Dharma here, my robe does not move. Where can you find any wind in it? It has no hidden place where wind can be stored. If the wind comes from the void, why does it not fan the man when your robe is still? Moreover, the void is permanent, and so should be the wind. Then, without the wind, there would be no void. You can feel when the wind stops fanning, but what indication can there be when the void ceases to exist? If the void can be created and destroyed, it cannot really be void, and if it is, how can it create the wind? If the wind comes from your neighbor's face, it should also fan you. Then why does not your robe, when brushing against him, fan you back? Look into this carefully. The robe which you adjust is yours. The face fanned is that of another bhikshu, and the void is still and does not move. Then where does the wind come from? The wind and the void differ and can neither mix nor unite, while the wind cannot exist of itself without a cause. You do not realize that in the Tathagata store, wind and its opposite, the void, arise from self-nature and are identical with each other that the element of wind is fundamentally pure and clean and embraces all in the Dharma realm and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things. If, Ananda, you move your robe, a light wind stirs, and if there is similar movement throughout the Dharma realm, there will be wind all over the world in accordance with the laws of karma and not in a given place or direction. Ignorant worldlings attribute the element of wind to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate without realizing that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Space Ananda, space has no shape and is discernible only where there is form. As Shravasti is far from the river, People of different castes, such as Kshatriya, Brahmin, Vaisya, Sudra, Bharadvaja, and Chandala, who come to live there, dig wells to find water. Each foot of earth 
is replaced by a foot of space and 10 feet of earth by 10 feet of space, so that the shallowness or depth of each well corresponds with the amount of earth removed. Does this space come from the earth, from the digging, or from itself as such? Ananda, if space exists of itself, why, before the digging, was it not unobstructed by the earth? Why was there only earth without any space being seen there? If space comes from the earth, it should be seen to enter the well when the earth is being dug out. If only the earth is removed without space entering the well, how can space come from the earth? If earth is not excavated and space does not fill in the hole, both space and earth should be the same. Then why is not space dug out with the earth? If space comes from the digging, when the former is produced by the latter, no earth should be removed. If space does not come from the digging, why, when earth is being dug out, is space seen in the well? Think about all this and see where space comes from when a man uses his hands to dig earth to make a well. For digging and space are not in the same category and can be neither mixed nor united. And it is absurd to suppose that space exists of itself without coming from any cause. If space is perfectly all-embracing and essentially unmoving, you should know that it and the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, which together are called the five elements, intermingle naturally and are merely the uncreated and unending Tathagata store. Ananda, since your mind is deluded and you remain unaware of the real identity of the four elements in the Tathagata store, you should look into space and see whether or not it comes or goes, or neither comes nor goes. You do not know that in the Tathagata store, Bodhi and its opposite, the void, arise from the self-nature and are identical with each other, because the element of space is fundamentally pure and clean, embraces all, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things. The ten quarters, Ananda, are like an empty pit filled with space, which, in accordance with the laws of karma, has no given place nor direction. Ignorant worldlings attribute this to cause, condition, and the state of the self as such, because their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate without knowing that the language they use has no real meaning. The Element of Perception Perception knows nothing by itself and only manifests through form and voidness. As you are now in Jetavana Park, you see light by day and darkness in the evening. At night there is light when the moon shines and darkness when there is no moon. This light and darkness are discerned by the seeing, but is this seeing of the same nature as light, darkness, and the void, or not? Is it the same or different from them? Ananda, if the seeing is of the same nature as light, darkness, or the void, we come to this. As light and darkness alternate, and when there is one, the other disappears. Then, if the seeing is one with darkness, it should vanish when there is light, and vice versa. As the seeing disappears in both cases, why are light and darkness still seen? As they differ, it follows that the seeing is beyond creation and annihilation. If so, how can the seeing be the same as light and darkness? If the seeing is not of the same nature as light and darkness, try to find out what this seeing looks like apart from light, darkness, and the void, without which there can be no seeing, like the hair of a tortoise and the horns of a hare. As light, darkness, and the void differ, where can the seeing be? As light and darkness are in opposition, how can the seeing equate with them? If there is no seeing without light, darkness, and the void, how can it differ from them? If you try to separate the void from the seeing, you will not find their boundaries. If so, why are they not the same thing? When you see light and darkness, your seeing does not change, so why does it not differ from them? If you look closely and minutely 
into all this and examine it again and again, you will find that light comes from the sun, darkness from the moonless night, clearance from space, and obstruction from the earth. So where is the begetter of this essence of seeing? Since the seeing can discern whereas the void cannot, they can neither mix nor unite. And we cannot say that this essence of seeing comes from nowhere. You should know that perception by seeing and hearing, which pervades all and essentially does not change, and boundless unmoving space, as well as its moving counterparts as such, the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, all of which are called the six elements, intermingle by nature and are the fundamental uncreated and unending Tathagata store. You are infatuated by nature and do not understand that seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing fundamentally come from the Tathagata store. You should inquire into them and see if they pertain to birth and death, if they are one or many, if they pertain neither to birth nor death, and if they are neither one nor many. You do not know that in the Tathagata store, self-natured seeing is basically the enlightened perception which is pure and clean, embraces all the Dharma realm, and manifests because the minds of living beings know and distinguish between things. Like seeing, which pervades the whole Dharma realm, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, as well as the activities of body and mind, have wonderful virtues which are bright and universal, and so are not in a given place or direction. They manifest according to the laws of karma, but ignorant worldlings think wrongly that they are causal, conditional, and due to the self as such. Because of their consciousnesses, they differentiate and discriminate, and do not know that their language has no real meaning. The Element of Consciousness Ananda, consciousness has no origin, and is an illusion arising from the six organs and sense data. Look at this holy assembly, and turn round to see those present. Your eyes are like a mirror which cannot discern, while your consciousness notices in turn the presence of Manjushri, Purna Maitriyani Putra, Mount Galyayana, Subhuti, Sariputra, etc. Does this consciousness come from perception, form, or the void? Or does it emerge suddenly without any cause? Ananda, if your consciousness comes from your seeing perception, then in the absence of light, darkness, form, and the void, there would be no seeing. And when there is no perception, how can it create consciousness? If your consciousness comes from form, that is not from perception, then when light and darkness are not seen, there are neither form nor the void. Then how can non-existing form create consciousness? If your consciousness comes from the void that is neither from form nor perception, the absence of perception means also that of discernment, which implies the non-perception of light, darkness, form, and the void. And the absence of form is the end of all external causes. How then can your seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing occur? Thus, without form and perception, consciousness which comes from the void simply does not exist. On the other hand, if it exists in the absence of objects, what can it discern? If your consciousness suddenly emerges without any cause, why cannot it discern the moon in the daytime? Now, look closely and minutely into all this. Your seeing perception depends on the pupils of your eyes meeting an external object, which is when there is form and is not when there is no form. These are the four causes, that is, the seeing, eyes, form, and voidness, from which consciousness arises. But which one of them creates consciousness? Since consciousness is always moving to differentiate, whereas perception is still, for it does not discriminate, they cannot mix and fuse together. Your hearing, feeling, and knowing are in the same category as your seeing. But your consciousness should still have a source. 
If this consciousness comes from nothing, you should know that perception by means of seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing pervades everywhere and comes not from any source. Moreover, with space, earth, water, fire, and wind, they are called the seven elements, the natures of which are real and intermingle freely, being but the uncreated and unending Tathagata store. Ananda, because your mind is unsettled, you do not realize that the seeing and hearing that arouse consciousness comes fundamentally from the Tathagata store. You should look into the consciousness inside the six entrances and see if they are the same or different, exist or not are neither the same nor different, and neither exist nor not. For you do not realize that in the Tathagata store, self-natured consciousness is the enlightened basic Bodhi, which embraces and pervades the whole Dharma realm, is not to be found in a given place or direction, and manifests according to the laws of karma. Ignorant worldlings think wrongly that it is causal, conditional, and due to the self as such, according to the way their consciousnesses differentiate and discriminate, while they do not know that the language they use has no real meaning. Ananda's Understanding Expressed in His Gatha After listening to the Buddha's profound instruction, Ananda and the assembly realized that their bodies and minds were now free from all obstructions. Each understood that his self-mind pervaded the ten directions of space, which he saw clearly like a leaf held in his own hand, and that all things were the wondrous and bright fundamental mind of Bodhi. While his essence of mind embraced all and contained the ten directions, he looked back at his own body given him by his parents, which was like a speck of dust dancing in the great void, sometimes visible and sometimes not, like a bubble rising and falling aimlessly in a boundless clear ocean. After seeing all this clearly, they all realized their fundamental, profound, permanent and indestructible self-minds, and brought their palms together to pay reverence to the Buddha, thanking him for showing them what they had never seen before. Thereupon, Ananda praised the Buddha in the following Gatha. O thou serene, all-powerful and unchanging Lord, rare is your all-embracing supreme Surangama, which helps me to root out wrong thoughts that have been held for untold eons and teaches me how to realize Dharmakaya in an instant. May I now win the fruit and achieve enlightenment to save living beings countless as the Ganges sands. To myriad Buddha lands I now offer this mind profound to repay my debt of gratitude for the grace of the Lord. Humbly I now implore the world-honored one to seal my oath to re-enter the five turbid realms, wherein if even one being fails to become a Buddha, I shall at once renounce all my claims to nirvana. O oh, great hero, the mighty, the compassionate one, may you also destroy my last secret delusion, so that I soon attain to Bodhi Supreme, sitting in Bodhi Mandalas everywhere. The void to an end may come, but my firm mind will not flinch. <laughs> 